Presented by Caltech. Good evening. Thank you all for uh, coming out tonight to this event to listen to Victoria. Humans have long been fascinated by extreme environments. We are, after all, by virtue of thinking from inside our bodies, the very center of our world, while everything and everyone else is on its periphery. Last night, Caltech hosted popular author Hampton Sides, who chronicled the gilded era of polar exploration in the late 1800s. These explorers were gripped with a fever to understand the high ice of the Arctic Ocean and what unexplored lands laid beyond it. Tonight, our featured speaker is infected with a different kind of exploration feature, uh, fever, a fever induced by microorganisms, and one that drives her to the far corners of the earth and the great depths of the ocean. But unlike many 19th century explorers, Victoria always comes back to us. <laughs> she seems to be able to do it better. Victoria Orphan is the James Irvine Professor of Environmental Science and Geobiology in Caltech's Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences. She received her bachelor's degree in aquatic biology from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 1994. She stayed there for her PhD, which she got in ecology, evolution, and marine biology in 2001. She did a postdoc sponsored by the National Research Council for three years at NASA Ames. And then she joined the faculty in the geobiology option of GPS division in 2004. She was named the James Irvine Professor in Environmental Science and Geobiology in 2016, and she was recently appointed the director of the Kirchhoff Marine Laboratory hosted by Caltech's Division of Biology and Biological Engineering. Vic's research incorporates a variety of techniques to study the ecology and species interactions within microbial communities, with an emphasis on microbial consortia involved in the cycling of methane, sulfur, and nitrogen in anoxic ocean ecosystems, deep subsurface, and extreme environments. She helped to pioneer novel stable isotope applications using secondary ion mass spectroscopy for measuring single cell activity and metabolic potential of uncultured microorganisms in environmental samples, this means in natural environments, and has applied these techniques to develop new understanding into globally important syntrophic interactions between methane oxidizing archaea and sulfate reducing bacteria. Victoria has received many honors, but is perhaps best known for being named a MacArthur Fellow in 2016. Please join me in welcoming Victoria. All right, and thank you, John, for that nice introduction. I'm excited to share with you the hidden world of microbes and their importance in the ocean and how they help collectively make this a habitable world for us here on Earth. I'm also hoping to give you a little bit of insight into our scientific approach and how we study microorganisms and their activities in nature. So I want to start off by saying that I've always been interested in the ocean since I was a, a young child. And weird and wonderful creatures like this deep sea fish here really sparked my imagination. But I could not have predicted then that the organisms that have most captured my attention today and are the focus of my research are among the smallest in the ocean, that is the microbes. So bacteria and archaea are among the oldest life forms on our planet, dating well back over three billion years. And as a geobiologist, one of the big questions that we're trying to answer is, what have these organisms been doing for all of this time? Well, so if you ask the average person on the street, what do bacteria do? Most people would probably say, oh, they're just causing trouble. <laughs> and that's because most of the microorganisms, the bacteria that we're familiar with, are the ones that usually make us sick. The reality is that those pathogenic organisms only represent a very small fraction of the total diversity of microbial life on Earth. And most microorganisms 
in nature are critical for ecosystem functioning. Whether that ecosystem is our own body or in the ocean, microbes are making a difference in how uh, matter is processed in these systems. So let's put this diversity into context. What I'm showing you in this um, schematic here, you can think of kind of like a tree of life for, or a family tree of all of life. Um, and this is built off of DNA. It's a gene that's universal found in all life forms. So be it you and I, or the bacteria, or another single-celled uh, organism called archaea. If we look at all of the branches on this tree, what you'll realize is that most of the diversity on our planet is microbial. That is, organisms that are invisible to our naked eye. This even includes the eukarya of which we belong. So to put us into context, we sit here on the tip of the branch, and our neighbor here is corn. <laughs> So we, we've, uh, with advances in sequencing technology, we've gotten a very rich picture of diversity of, of microbial life uh, in nature. And what we've realized is that most of the organisms that we have in culture collections, so we can kind of think of this like microbial zoos, represent far less than 1% of the diversity that's in nature. So most of the microorganisms are out there are things we only know from gene sequences, and we're still at the process of trying to understand what they're doing in the environment. So as a microbial ecologist and geobiologist, this is one of the exciting challenges for us, is, is how do we go out in nature and understand what these organisms are doing? Now, it's also important to put this diversity into the context of biomass. And so if any of you had the opportunity to go to Michael Dickinson's Watson lecture a couple of months ago, you probably would have walked away from that lecture with a newfound appreciation for just how awesome insects are on the planet. And it's true that if we compare the weight of termites alone globally to all of the human population, 7.6 billion strong, termites weigh the same amount as all of us, right? If we scale this up to arthropods, of which insects belong, they outweigh us 24 to 1 globally. But really, that pales in comparison when we think about the microbes. So the archaea and bacteria on our planet, pound for pound, outweigh us 63 to 1. And this is even more astounding when we remember the small size of a microbe. So what I'm showing you here is the fine tip of a sewing needle, and all of these orange specks you see here are bacteria, numbering probably in the thousands. So just from their sheer biomass alone, we have to realize that these organisms are important in the functioning of the biosphere. And if we think about the major elements that make up our biomass, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, phosphorus, maybe even a little sulfur, microbes really sit at the center of cycling of all of these major elements on our planet. But today I wanted to talk about Earth's largest biome, and that is the ocean. So the ocean covers 71% of our surface. 97% of all of the water on Earth is found in the ocean. And if we think about the types of processes that microorganisms catalyze in the ocean, perhaps photosynthesis is one of the most important. So there are microscopic organisms that, like plants, live in the ocean, and they fix carbon dioxide using light energy, and in turn release oxygen back to the atmosphere. So we can kind of think about the oceans as like a giant inverse lung. They're taking carbon dioxide in and releasing oxygen. In fact, half of the oxygen in our atmosphere that we breathe is coming from these microscopic algae and cyanobacteria in the ocean. And we can even track their activities 
from space that's shown in this movie here by looking at the light harvesting pigment chlorophyll that's in their biomass. Now the reality is though that we're very limited in how much information we can learn from the ocean because most of the ocean is covered, is um, represented by deep ocean waters. And to be able to explore the depths of the ocean requires specialized instrumentation and vehicles like this human occupied vehicle, Alvin, shown here. And I feel very fortunate to be one of a relatively few number of scientists that have had the opportunity to see the ocean bottom first hand. Western launch altitude and permission to dive when the swimmers are clear. Clear to dive when the swimmers are clear. Copy, Avon, Alvin. Oh, Alvin diving. 25 meters. So looking out the viewport from the inside of the sub, we realize that the light becomes dim quickly. The pressures are rising and the temperatures are dropping to something akin to your refrigerator. 100. By the time we hit 100 meters, we're in complete blackness. And we ride that way for a long time. Occasionally, sparks of light from bioluminescent organisms are hitting the sub. All right, 1808, we're gonna set down here. We've got the gray and white hat. When we go to the seafloor, we can flip on the lights and are treated to this amazing view. Animals that are living off of chemical energy produced by microbes in the deep ocean. So very little of our planet's surface has actually been explored. And this is because most of the surface of the Earth is covered by deep ocean waters. And if we pull the ocean away, this is sort of a model of what the planet would look like. And far from having sort of a boring, flat, muddy bottom, what we see is there's tremendous topography underlying the oceans that rivals what we see on the continents. So huge mountain ranges like this in the mid-Atlantic ridge here shown in red, very deep trenches where we could fit some of the largest mountain tops in it whole um, in the deep ocean. This is really one of the last unexplored frontiers on Earth is in the ocean. So to put this um, into context, let's look at a little patch of the ocean off of Northern California. This is the Monterey uh, Bay area, and this is a place where I've done some of my research. And off of the coast of Monterey, there's a very deep submarine canyon system that allows scientists to get into deep ocean water relatively close to shore. To give you a sense of the size of this here, this uh, canyon is about on the same border as the Grand Canyon. Now researchers at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research uh, Institute have been studying this canyon system for well over two decades now using submersibles. And despite having logged well over 6,000 dives, and those are shown here as the red tracks, uh, this still only equates to less than a quarter of 1% of the seafloor that's been explored. So there's a lot we have to learn about the deep ocean system. Now, I mentioned uh, the importance of these photosynthetic organisms in the surface ocean and their role in CO2 fixation. There's also an important role for microorganisms to play in the deep ocean carbon cycle as well. In this case, the carbon I'm talking about is methane. And like CO2, methane is another greenhouse gas. It has 28 times the radiative forcing or warming potential as CO2 if you average it over a 100-year time scale. So it matters in understanding the sources and sinks of methane. Now in the oceans, there are huge reservoirs of methane that are stored along the margins of our continents. And most of this methane is in the form of an ice-like substance called methane hydrate that's stable under the cold temperatures and high pressures of the deep sea. So we can see this is the area of stability um, shown here. 
Now, we don't have a really good handle on just how much hydrate there exists globally, but it's believed to be at least as much as, if not greater than, all of the fossil fuel reserves known on Earth today. So that's coal, oil, and natural gas. So despite the fact that there is this huge potential reservoir of methane, they contribute very little to the atmospheric contributions of methane, uh, where it serves as, as a greenhouse gas. And this is because of microbes. So in areas where the pressures are less and more shallow uh, depths, or the temperatures are slightly higher, uh, these methane hydrates can off-gas leading to release of methane at the seabed. Occasionally, we see these sort of gas plumes happening in this video here. What's not shown um, through this video is just how much of that methane is actually being consumed by microorganisms in the sediments before it has a chance to get out into the overlying water. In fact, something on the order of 80% of that methane is oxidized by microorganisms um, in the, the sediments below. And these microbes do this oxidation process not by using oxygen in the seawater, but by respiring sulfate, which is found um, in the seawater as well. So let's look at this um, equation another way. So these organisms are basically breathing methane using sulfate, releasing CO2, and hydrogen sulfide. Now this is a pretty exotic metabolism, and it's a good illustration for why many microbiologists consider microorganisms to be the master chemists of the planet. You can think of almost any possible chemical coupling that leads to a little bit of energy, and you can be sure that there's a likely an organism that has figured out a way to make a living on it. Now, if we compare this to our relatively limited metabolism of all uh, multicellular animals, be that you or I, a butterfly, or a hedgehog, we're, we're pretty much stuck with using organic carbon with oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. So even though these guys look really simple, their chemistry and the feats that they catalyze are really quite astounding on Earth. Now, what we've learned in studying these methane-munching microbes is that they don't do this process alone, but rather they team up with a partner. One organism does the first half of the reaction to oxidize the methane. The second organism uses the sulfate, reduces it to hydrogen sulfide, using energy that's coming from methane. Now, this process of combining methane with sulfate doesn't give you very much energy to work with for a single organism, let alone sharing it between two microbes. And as a consequence, these organisms divide very slowly. So like once every three months, they divide. We can compare this with a more familiar organism like E. coli, who also uses organic carbon with oxygen. And this organism makes a replication of itself every 20 minutes. So I did a quick um, back-of-the-envelope calculation, and in the 14 years that I've been on the faculty here at Caltech, these organisms have divided a total of 56 times, <laughs> or maybe 24 times if we put it into PhD units. Okay? <laughs> this is a feat that an E. coli can accomplish in less than a day. So it's no wonder that E. coli are among the best studied organisms in labs worldwide. But it's likely that organisms in the environment are growing much more slowly than those sort of domesticated, fast-growing organisms in the lab. And if we really want to understand the uncultured majority in nature, we really need to start focusing on those that might not be as tractable to study in a test tube. All right, so the big challenge then is how do we study an organism that is growing very slowly, and how do we translate processes that these organisms are catalyzing on the scale of microns back up to 
the global geochemical cycles. And really, in thinking about this, this is not so dissimilar to the kinds of challenges my colleagues in planetary science and astronomy face when they're trying to measure the properties of a distant star outside of our solar system. Of course, in our case, we have the opposite problem. We're trying to measure something that is a micron in size that's living over a mile deep in the bottom of the ocean. And if we're interested in studying methane, we go to places on the seafloor like this methane seep environment where it's, we can find copious amounts of organisms oxidizing methane. And these are really an ideal natural laboratory to study this process. We can take cores of sediment, and even in a gram of sediment, um, we find billions of microorganisms, many of them we believe are catalyzing this process. And by looking even closer, we can now start to look at the processes that they are catalyzing on a scale that really is more relevant for those microorganisms in situ, and then try to relate that back to the local and global geochemistry. Okay. So I have to admit, I really love mud. And um, this, this, po uh, this uh, quote by one of my scientific heroes, Rachel Carson, in her book, The Sea Around Us, really resonates with me, that the sediments are a sort of epic poem of the Earth. And it's a really exciting time, because the technologies are now at a point where we can start reading the words of this poem of the sediments and start to understand the activities, diversity, and interactions of microorganisms that are living in these deep um, ocean muds. So how do we go about looking at these microbial communities in the deep ocean sediments? Well, I'm a very visual person, and so I really like to see the organisms that we're studying. And we try to look at these organisms through the lens of the genes in their genomes, as well as the chemical compositions of these organisms to give us clues into what they're doing. So if we take a little bit of this sediment and we look at the diversity of organisms in there, what we find are big aggregations of many cells of an organism known as archaea and bacteria that are living together. And these are all of the things you see here that are stained in green and pink amongst a backdrop of sediment particles that are shown in orange. If we look a little more closer at these, we see that there's a tremendous amount of diversity. And this is diversity of different species that are living in association with each other. There are differences in the types of structure um, and, where, and how these organisms are arranged in an aggregate and over all size. And so the question is, are all of these organisms doing the same thing in the sample? Why do we see so much diversity in these environments? So one way we as uh, environmental microbiologists have tried to answer this question is by looking at the genes to give us clues to their function. So a genome you can kind of think of like a blueprint of, for a microbe. So we learn something about the model type. We can get a parts list, just like the genes. We can even get instructions on how to assemble this thing and in what order. Right? And so this can give us clues into the potential functioning of our model microbe. The reality is, though, that even when we have a completed genome of a single microorganism, rarely do we fully understand what it's doing in nature. And this problem becomes even more compounded when you try to assemble genomes from an environmental sample where you have thousands of species that are all coexisting together. So a good analogy is like thinking about taking many jigsaw puzzles and dumping them all together in one big pile and then trying to reassemble all of the pieces um, afterwards. Now, fortunately, the computer algorithms we have now are good enough that we can begin to start to deconvolve these different species within the environment, but rarely do we complete a, a get a complete picture 
of these organisms. Um, even with this sort of partial data, there's still valuable information that we can learn about these organisms, though. So what I'm showing you here is some metagenomic data that we've um, generated from some of these methane seep environments to learn about the organisms that are living there. And what you see here are two genome bins that we've been able to reconstruct out of um, these seep sediments. Each ring that you see on this um, circle here represents a different metagenome associated with a different sort of depth in a methane um, seep environment. And the thickness of the lines here represent the number of sequences that were associated with each of these genome bins. So with this kind of data, we can get information about the distribution of the organisms. So is it well represented across all of these samples? Does it have a more patchy distribution? We can also then look at the genes themselves that are found in each of these bins to give us information about what these organisms might be doing. In this case, this bin associated with the archaea had genes that we think are involved in methane metabolism. This green bacterial bin over here had genes associated with sulfate reduction. So we can use this to develop and refine hypotheses about what these organisms are doing. So maybe a working hypothesis would be that these archaea can metabolize methane in the environment. Now we can also use the sequence information within these genomes to help us visualize these organisms by adding a fluorescent probe that targets the specific organisms. So we can design a probe that's complementary to this red genome bin, add the probe into the sample with a fluorescent tag, and then be able to see these organisms under the microscope. This is an example of how we apply this technique. Again, the red is this organism here, and the green represents this organism here. So we get information not only about maybe the abundance and the morphology of these organisms, but we can start to look to see who's associated with whom in these environments. Now, it's also important to remember that just because you see genes in an organism's genome does not necessarily equate to its potential function in the environment. And so how do we go about testing these hypotheses that came out of the genome? Well, the way that we approach this in our lab is by looking at chemical signatures in the cells themselves, and in this case, uh, using stable isotopes. So what I'm showing you here are the two stable forms of carbon. So carbon-12 is by far the most abundant form on Earth. In its nucleus, it has six protons and six neutrons. But there's also a minor form that exists in nature as well, carbon-13, that has an additional neutron that exists at about the 1% level. Now, biological enzymes react differently to these two different forms of carbon that end up with different ratios of carbon-12 to carbon-13 that get recorded in the biomass. So we can kind of think of these isotopes uh, like two baseballs that look identical on the outside, but they have different core makeups in the interior. So maybe one is made of cork, the other is made of cement, cork ball is going to fly a lot faster and further than the one filled with cement. So ecologists have used stable isotopes for, for quite a while to try to reconstruct food webs in ecosystems and learn a little bit about the diets of organisms. And this is a, a classic example here, looking at two carbon fixation pathways of plants. There's the C4 pathway of which corn belongs and the C3 pathway for rice and wheat. And what we can just see is that in carbon isotope space, they are distinguishable from one another. And so if you sort of follow the old adage, you are what you eat, if you eat a primarily a corn-based diet, you're going to have, in turn, an isotope signature that is similar to corn. And if you eat rice, you're going to end up more over on this end. Okay. 
So I wanted to give you a real life example and put this to the test. And so we diligently went out and took fingernail samples from all of the orphan lab members <laughs> and measured their isotopic composition to ask what their inferred diets were. We had a lot of people who were self-proclaimed vegetarians who might not have been, according to the data, but, <laughs> but we'll see. So, so again, so if we, sh if we sort of orient you on this scale here, so the lab members are up here in these blue circles. Uh, we have carbon isotope space over here, corn on this end, rice on this end, and then I've added this other axis up here, and this is nitrogen isotope. Uh, composition, and this gives us information about the trophic level, right? So if you're low on this end of the spectrum, you're more of an herbivore, and the further up you go, the more carnivorous you are. And so we can see there's a good spread in the data for our lab here. We have some that are clustering close to the average values of vegetarians and vegans, and we have some that are slightly more carnivorous. And then we have this one outlier here. <laughs> And this is from a lab member uh, who had a very restricted diet due to a genetic condition, actually. And so his isotopic values were pretty much indistinguishable from that of a chicken. <laughs> so there's a lot of valuable information we can get out of this type of data. Now, for me, interested in microbial metabolism, uh, we can also use a stable isotope techniques. And if you are in the business of tracking methane in the environments, there really is no better tracer than to look at carbon isotopes because it has such a negative isotopic signature naturally. I like to think of carbon or look, think of methane as sort of the garlic of the carbon isotope world. It's really obvious when an organism's been eating it. <laughs> So we can even use this type of signature to look for evidence of methane metabolism in ancient ecosystems long after the microorganisms have gone. What I'm showing you here is some, uh, a picture of a paleo seep that's over 66 million years ago um, off of Northern California. And so if you measure the isotopic composition of these carbonates, they too look similar to what we see with methane. And this is John Grotzinger here for scale. <laughs> so the question for us then is, is, how do we test this hypothesis of whether or not these archaeal bacterial aggregates we see in the seep environment are consuming methane? And can we use these isotopic techniques? And you can imagine trying to get an isotope value from something that's only a few microns in size is a significantly greater challenge than measuring somebody's fingernail. And to do this requires some special instrumentation. And we're fortunate enough to have two such instruments at Caltech in the Center for Microanalysis. And these ion microprobe instruments allow us to make precision measurements of isotopic compositions on very small sample sizes. And so we use this technique to measure our microbes. And we use a technique known as secondary ion mass spectrometry. And what this allows us to do is to focus a primary beam of ions directly onto our small sample size. The beam size in this case is anywhere from 50 nanometers in size up to about uh, 10 microns, depending on the instrument. We can collect secondary ions from the biomass, and then count the number of carbon-12s, carbon-13s in that sample to give us information about the isotope ratio. Now, if we do this for samples that we've identified with these DNA probes, we now can link identity to its chemical isotope signature. And we did this for a number of different aggregates of archaea and bacteria found in these seep environments. And when we measured their carbon isotopes, they did indeed have a very negative value indicative of methane consumption. So we also have been using stable isotopes as a tool to trace the flow 
of carbon and nitrogen and look at the activity of cells. And in this case, instead of looking at the natural abundance isotopes that are just in the biomass itself, we add in a heavy labeled substrate and then can trace it into the cells. So in this case, we are interested in the incorporation of ammonium into these systems as a proxy for activity. So we fed them a 15N heavy form of ammonium directly into the mud, let the organisms do their thing, and then those organisms that are capable of consuming that um, ammonium will in turn incorporate that heavy isotope into their biomass. Now we can use this secondary ion mass spectrometry technique then to map the activity patterns cell by cell within these clusters. And so this is the data from this or organism here, and you see the yellow coloration are areas that show higher levels of activity. So this is really a powerful tool because it allows us to look at activity while maintaining the spatial organization of the organisms themselves. And we can sort of create these weighted maps to look to see if there are any overarching patterns in the activities that we see to learn a little bit more about the symbiosis that's driving methane oxidation. So we've done this type of analysis for a number of different microorganisms, and this represents different types of species that have living, living together, different types of structural arrangements, and in doing so, we're getting a much uh, richer picture of how these organisms are um, distributed in terms of their activity space in the environment. And the ability to be able to do this at the single cell level is allowing us to ask much more detailed questions about the nature of this symbiosis and how energy might be shared between the two partners. So for instance, can we tell differences between cells that are sharing uh, close proximity to their nearest symbiont versus those organisms that are only surrounded by like cells? These kinds of questions are almost impossible to answer if you're just looking at the DNA level. We don't see any difference in this picture here, but when we compare it with the isotope data that we get using secondary ion mass spectrometry, we can now start to get a better idea of how activity is distributed in these aggregates. And in doing this, we're getting some new insights into how this symbiosis works and what sort of molecules might be exchanged and how, how do these organisms really conserve energy in living uh, together. We've even gotten to the point now where we can start to apply even higher resolution techniques to start to look at the interiors of the cells. And this is a TEM image, so it's transmission electron microscopy. We can look at the spaces between the cells. We can look at the structures within the cells. And all of this is giving us clues into how these uncultured organisms are operating in situ. And this is pretty impressive if we remember that these organisms were recovered from deep sea marine mud. So in my mind, every aggregate has a story to tell. And in looking across a diversity of different aggregate types, we are learning a lot more about how these organisms are mediating methane oxidation in the deep ocean, as well as understanding a little bit about the ecology of these environments or what drives the diversity of different um, types of organisms that live together. So I wanted to finally come back to this question uh, of microbial life support. And I hope that you all have, um, will leave here with sort of a newfound appreciation for the role of microorganisms, not only in the ocean, but um, in sustaining life around us, be it through the production of oxygen or the mediation of greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane in the environment. 
um, these microorganisms really matter and, and play a role. And it's, it is a really important and exciting time to start to ask questions about how these interactions between species, um, how fast they grow, what kinds of processes they're mediating in natural systems are operating together um, in order to really be able to understand how these systems might change in the face of changing environmental conditions, be that um, in the deep sea related to human or related to mining conditions uh, or natural perturbations that might happen. And so we're sort of at a point now where we have the technologies to really begin to put these organisms in their, their global um, context. So if I've sparked your interest in the microbial world, I encourage you all to, to look not just in the deep ocean, but all around you. So these microbes are ubiquitous, and you can go to your backyard and grab a little pinch of soil. You might take a drop of water from the Beckman lily pond on your way out and find a microscope and just immerse yourself into this amazing world. So I wanted to end by um, really thanking the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. It really um, takes a village to understand the microbial ecosystems in the deep ocean, and I have one of the most amazing uh, teams of uh, students and postdocs that have worked with me to, to help figure out the mysteries of these deep ocean ecosystems. Uh, this is not the full lab, but these are people who have contributed um, data and their time to, to this talk, and I thank you. I also would like to acknowledge my family who is here this evening uh, to listen to this talk. It's always a really special time to be able to uh, be able to share my science with them as well. And uh, I'm happy to um, stay and, and answer any questions for you. And I also have a few um, origami microscopes that I'm willing to hand out to folks if you want to take a look and really seriously get some samples from Beckman Pond. Um, and so the members of my lab will be in the aisles and we can hand them out. This is uh, called Fold Scope and it was uh, designed by a faculty member at Stanford. And uh, I just want to share this wonderful world with you all. So thank you very much.